microphone? Yes, I have. So, a typical customer is normally not Google, Amazon, whatever. So, in the typical network operator don't has a PhD and is not so smart like you guys. So, what is your expectation to a former or say for the future of a network operator in related to skill sets? Because normally, in, in contrast to the Amazons, a networking crew has no programming skills at all. So they grew up with how to configure BGP, OSPF, whatever, but they have zero programming skills. But this is all about software development and <coughs> programming. So what do you say expectation? How do you think it's the future of a network operator? Can I take a swing at that? Thanks. I, I, I will not turn on my mic here just to cause not horrible feedback. But so uh, it, definitely you're right. You know, operators aren't going to program a network. But I kind of think there's a lot of room for them to script the network. And so that's why I showed the, the little Python program that I threw together. It's, you know, it's nothing complicated. It really is something that you could expect a network operator to write. You know, if Python's not the right language, then something that speaks REST is. And, you know, whether this is just you know, having an inventory system or you know, doing something more complicated, you know, I have another version of that that you know, grabs the list of hosts in the network and pings everything just to make sure it's alive. Those types of little self-tests, I, I think it's very reasonable for, to, for us to think that a network operator might do that. And trying to enable the controller, the, the, the bit of logic between OpenFlow and whatever that script is, I, I think that's really where the magic is. And, and I think that's where you know, a bunch of the other controller writers are going to in as well. Anyone else want to jump on that? So I also think, too, that uh, the controllers you saw today in their existing framework are not something you're going to there's a big delta between these sort of test controllers and something you would see in an Amazon or somewhere else. Companies like Big Switch, and I see or other, other organizations are building that, that delta that will allow people in these organizations to easily go to a web interface and, and click a few commands and, and do a lot of, if not everything, that they would do today in the uh, you know, SMP scripts and whatever else. So. All right. Next question. It's just following up to this one. So if, if they wouldn't do things different like today, so why should they change? So if they're still using BGP, OSPF, whatever, just having an open flow API in between, or just having a different GUI to do the same things, then why should they change? So I think the motivation is to do something different. But if I got it right to do something different, you have to have programming skills, and you have to do this in C++, Python, whatever. I'm correct, or? So if I want to implement different forwarding schemes like I've been doing today with... It's my belief that, you know, five years from now, OpenFlow will be in implementation detail. And you would never ask Cisco if, you know, that their iOS is written in C or C++, because it doesn't matter to you. And, you know, for a customer-facing thing, I think whether OpenFlow is on the other side, they don't care. That said, I mean, programmatic APIs are, are totally, you know, have independent validated use of, uh, for all sorts of things. And you just look at what's going on in the, in the web. Uh, people will find ways to, to make them work without doing you know, what could reasonably be called programming. Okay, question about the um, beacon and floodlight. Uh, so what is the important things that you give up by moving away from OSGI framework? <laughs> uh, I mean, fundamentally, OSGI provides runtime modularity where you can pop code in and out at runtime. Um, it, it comes with uh, programmer complexity. Uh, there's no sugar coating that. If you're, if you're familiar with OSGI or you have a team that is, then, then maybe it's a non-issue. If you have to come up to speed on it, it does take a little bit of time. Uh, uh, sorry, I, I can't even hear you, so I don't have the rest of it. I said that, so if you take the CBench tool that I wrote and you run it against a current floodlight versus a current beacon, uh, I think beacons numbers, you get something like 8 million flow setups per second, and I think floodlights up to like 3. And she would say, oh, well, clearly flow, floodlight is slow, right? And, and so really what that is is Dave spent a long time fighting with uh, someone else who was championing Knox to 
to really, really optimize the learning switch behavior. Where right now, learning switch is not a critical application for us. So while my claim is that you know, the, the core is actually reasonably fast, and it might even be faster than all these things, we just simply have an optimized learning switch. That's what I was saying. It has nothing to do with the locks. Uh, I have a question about beacon and full light. Uh, what about clustering? Because running a single instance of a controller in a production environment doesn't look like a good idea. Yes. So, uh, as you said, Beacon currently is only single instance, so if, if you wanted to run this in a cluster, you would need to add this. Uh, it may be on the, the long-term roadmap, but it's not certainly not on the short-term roadmap. Um, Rob can weigh in on, on Floodlight, their plan. So, uh, for Floodlight, the, the critical thing is Floodlight is simply our open source offering. Our closed source commercial offering has both of those things. Thank you. said that uh, the open flow is just a little tiny thing uh, that connect the controller to the switches. Uh, could you refer to any plans to, for all the platform to support open flow versions higher than uh, uh, 1.0? Uh, I can't speak for the other controller authors, but I'm currently waiting for switches that support versions higher than 1.0. That's basically the same deal for Pox, is that it hasn't been too high on our priorities, largely because switches have not been available. Um, what's higher on our list of priorities right now is supporting uh, Nasira's extensions in OpenV switch because that is something that we use all the time. Uh, we will definitely be supporting OpenFlow 1.x. Uh, I can't give a timeline right now, but my, my personal belief is it will be definitely sometime this year. Yeah, for sure we have yeah no plan for supporting running one point one or higher. But uh, so um, uh, for example, this little extension could be uh, implemented on the application space of the technology. I guess also uh, it's worth noting that most of the OBS extensions I I'm gonna guess this guy was talking about are actually standardized in future versions of open flow. So we are effectively the same. Right. Once, once we have those implemented and we start seeing those actually like in the wild, we'll you know, be translating from supporting extensions to supporting um, the, the actual 1.1, 1.2. All right, we have time for a few more questions. Yes, um, so we have seen different approaches to how applications on each uh, controller interact, share state, and we have seen the APIs from Trema, the network um, information-based approaches of Onyx, the service-based approaches of Beacon, Floodlight. Um, so how do you see uh, the ecosystem of a true operating system evolving? Very platform-specific, or can I dream that on a scenario where I build my application and, each, and I, it can easily be ported to other uh, controllers. Um, take, for instance, if you want topology. Topology is more than an application. It would be like the library on top of I build my other applications. Um, just uh, wanted to know how each of you, based on your experience, uh, see this evolving. So at least today, from between Beacon and Floodlight, actually porting an application straightforward. Uh, to another platform it's more difficult, primarily due to language uh, differences. Um, I suspect there will be an evolution towards a common platform in the future. I think we're still in really early days, uh, and you know, I, I hesitate to even give a timeline on when, when that might occur, but um, I, I don't see a lot of that happening yet. Coalescing. I, I think we, we still aren't, aren't clear. We saw some, some great examples today on Pox and how they're looking at the handling configuration. Uh, I think there's a lot more exploration that really needs to happen before we sort of solidify and coalesce on, on a particular API. Otherwise, we could easily pick the wrong one. 
Um, is this live? Oh, hey, it is cool. Um, I, I guess I was going to say, if you think about what's going on with mobile handsets, you know, no such API exists right now. Right now, if you are a developer of mobile applications, you pick either iPhone or Android or kind of a long tail of other things. Uh, and I don't think it's actually hurt that market. Uh, in fact, you know, that market's kind of blowing up in your face. There's kind of an app for everything. And, and it's not clear to me that it actually really has to be a standard uh, across controllers. I, I think that different APIs and, and different things will, will, will drive that market. And we, we can have a naturally evolving standard if it makes sense. And it's not even clear to me that it does. So just to build on what Rob said really briefly, I think I might. Um, uh, you know, one of the things that we look at in Pox and what a lot of our research is on is really about exploring abstractions um, for SDN. And so, you know, we're still researching that. And, and other people may have different ideas about what abstractions are important. And that may depend on the applications that you expect to implement. And that may depend on various trade-offs that you're willing to make. Um, so, you know, for things like that, it just doesn't make sense maybe to standardize an API. Certainly not now. Um, and, and possibly, you know, uh, never for certain things because those abstractions do have, you know, trade-offs involved. Yeah, and uh, I think that uh, it's a great ecosystem that we have controllers for different languages, you know, Java and uh, um, Python, Ruby, C, C++, and, uh, you know, we can share the experience on that. And um, I don't think that, you know, uh, that for the low-level API, it's well, not easy to, you know, come up with the same API, but, uh, you know, for the higher-level API, like the you know, API, um, I think that there are some possibilities. So I'm uh, happy to talk with other you know, control authors or application developers to uh, talk about the no API. Yeah. Yeah. Wait for the next question. Almost there. So I was really intrigued by uh, Murphy's point about how um, the hybrid language architecture was sort of a failure with Knox, just added more complexity uh, and didn't seem to provide any value. Uh, and on the other hand, in Trema, there's a hybrid language uh, system that seems to work pretty well. So I sort of wonder, what's the difference between the two systems that led you to abandon the hybrid solution in Knox, but adopt it uh, apparently pretty successfully in Trema? Yes, for our case, you know, the hybrid language support is, you know, really, you know, high, you know, complexity for us. But um, luckily, we have the different engineers, and um, we are really collaborating. We have the engineers maintaining C part, and we have another engineer who are maintaining Ruby part, and then they, you know, talk with each other, and then, you know, take to, you know, make things happen, and then to, you know, uh, uh, they keep the consistency with C and Ruby. But so, so it's not an easy thing. So that may be uh, a really a, a main factor there, is that with you know, Knox, we didn't have dedicated engineers to doing either of it. And you know, like I said, I think we did a pretty good job of kind of on-demand implementing features in Python that people wanted. Uh, but that also requires that people demand features. And I think a lot of times people looked, saw, saw that it wasn't there, and kind of just assumed that you know, it wasn't going to be there, and that they didn't want to add it. Um, so, you know, it didn't work out too well for us, but if you have a, a team dedicated to doing it, maybe that's a better uh, solution. I mean, obviously, Nasira thought um, that at one point it was a good idea. Once again, they would have had people dedicated to uh, maintaining it. Great. One more question? Yeah, yeah I have a question about topology. Um, so re reading the specs, I was kind of concerned about the lack of attention to topology, which is something that distributed routing protocols do very well. You know, IGP's got pretty advanced state machines understand things about two-way communication. How far do you think in your implementation do you have to go to the point where you can understand base topology and, do, and, and manage it in as robust a fashion as distributed routing protocols do today? So I'd say that, that at least Beacon's topology modules is really simple. We send out uh, LLDP packets between switches at a, at a fixed interval that is not particularly fast. Uh, and so it, it can't detect uh, link failures extremely quickly, but it has worked for us for the last few years. Um, I think there's definitely room for improvement there, particularly if you could get down to like a physical layer and actually speed that up dramatically, maybe push this to the switch that alerts you instead of <coughs> having to send. 
I guess I would say, um, I, I don't mean this to sound flip, but uh, if you look through the OpenFlow uh, tutorial, or the OpenFlow spec, uh, you won't find anything about topology there. Much in the same way, if you look through the x86 spec, you won't find anything about World of Warcraft there. And, and it's, it's a matter of you know, these things to be built on top of each other. And you know, the, the, the question is, at what point do you actually need additional support? Um, and so all the, all the controllers up here dynamically discover the topology. Uh, they all figure it out in a, in a single directional way, meaning that you could actually have a single directional added uh, a L1 level. So uh, they're affected by emulating much of the, the same mechanisms that things like BGP use, uh, not necessarily going up down, down to the level of BFD. But uh, you can imagine, you know, they, they said hello messages, they, they sell uh, some topology discovery messages. In particular format, it's almost irrelevant. Uh, it's really just a question of you know, the convergence time and what sort of failure time. And all of those come back to scale. And so eventually there's a point where you need to explore. You actually need to support the switches for this, but it's actually not clear to me that we're even there. Um, you know, uh, a couple of us up here have worked to the fact that uh, you can actually, if you know, the recovery time you need is 15 milliseconds, which is kind of the number you get from uh, Sonic, that, that's actually readily achievable with some of the controllers up here. All right, great. I think we're going to have to end questions right here. We're going to have time for you guys to ask questions during the hands-on session. You don't actually have to put your hands on the computer and the hands-on. That's fine. Think of it as consulting hours if you want. I just want to close the controller showdown by pointing out that this is the first time we could have a controller showdown. That a year and a half ago, there weren't enough speakers to fill up this, these slots. There was really not, and that was pretty much it. And in the last year and a half, we've seen this many additional controllers. And it's more than just a, a four or five that you've seen today, there are a whole bunch of other ones out there. And in the slides, uh, there's a pointer to Martin's blog post about all the open source controller projects that are out there, in addition to closed source ones that we haven't even mentioned. So with that, we're going to take a 15 minute break, be back here at 3.15, and I'll explain the hands-on tutorial. Thanks.